This is the Advanced Brain Podcast with third-generation neurotechnology pioneer, entrepreneur, best-selling author, music producer, keynote and TEDx speaker, Alex Doman. Improve your mental wellness as Alex sits down with the leading thought leaders of our time about how to optimize your brain, body, and life with the latest and most powerful tools to help you reach your unlimited potential. This episode was previously recorded and released as part of the Sound Brain Fitness Series and is being re-released here in the Advanced Brain Podcast. Now, listen in and discover how to become the best version of yourself with Alex Doman. Welcome. I'm your host, Alex Doman from Advanced Brain Technologies. You can learn more about our vision to advance people's brains for a better life at advancedbrain.com. Now, we had some really great questions submitted for my guest, and we're going to do our best to answer those over the course of the next hour. Tonight's program is Breadhead, How Do We Prevent America's Most Feared Disease? Breadhead's a new documentary. It explores the impact of our diets and lifestyles on brain health. Because changes in the brain begin decades before Alzheimer's symptoms, the absolute best way we can move the needle on this disease is through minimizing risk when it matters most. Max Lugavere is directing this project, which includes interviews with David Perlmutter, MD, and many other thought leaders working to help prevent and treat this and other devastating neurodegenerative diseases. Tonight, we discuss Alzheimer's, the Breadhead documentary, and steps you can take to control your brain health. Now, let me tell you about my guest. Uh, Max Lugavere is a real prolific uh, content creator, filmmaker, and media personality. He's the director, writer, and narrator of Breadhead, an upcoming documentary exploring the impact of diet and lifestyle on brain health. His recent Kickstarter campaign raised double its goal, including off-site contributions, and received millions of impressions online with major national coverage and social media shares from influencers, including Maria Shriver, Jared Leto, Sir Ken Robinson, and Morgan Spurlock. Lugavere has written about science, technology, and health innovation for the Daily Beast, Fast Company, Huffington Post, and Psychology Today, among others, and his work has been covered by USA Today, Details, Men's Health, Forbes, Variety, U.S. News and World Report, Riot, and many more. He was featured on NBC Nightly News and in a widely circulated Wall Street Journal article titled, Alzheimer's Prevention for 30-somethings with No Symptoms. Having quickly become a leading voice for brain health among millennials, Lugavere regularly gives talks on the topic most recently at the Evolution of Brain Health Summit in New York. Prior to Breadhead, Max created and hosted AOL's top-viewed web series ever, Acting Disruptive, which he produced with Tribeca Digital Studios. Dubbed two parts big ideas, one part late-night talk show by Forbes and one of the best streaming shows of 2013 by Entertainment Weekly, the series earned upwards of 26 million views. Before that, Max was a prominent host and producer of Al Gore's Emmy-winning current TV during its most ambitious years, landing him a featured appearance and GAPS icons uh, campaign worldwide. Welcome, Max. Thank you very much, Alex. It's good to be here. Uh, you've been a busy guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what can I say? Running a, a Kickstarter campaign sucks your whole life up into a vortex of just. But like, boy, is it worth it, right? You just you crushed that goal you had of 75000 for the doc. Thank you so much. I mean, I had no idea how it was going to go, but I'm super, super happy um, that it went as well as it did. It's an exhilarating process. I mean, I have to say, I would recommend, you know, doing a crowdfunding campaign to anybody with a passion project. Yeah, it was so, awesome. So, so I'm curious, what, what, um, caused you to go the crowdfunding, uh, crowdsourcing uh, route to uh, fund the film. I mean, you've you've been in Hollywood. You're a media personality. I imagine you could, you know, get some studio interest for the film. Why go that direction? That's a great question. Um, well, you know, honestly, my you know my previous work, I you know I worked in television for for Al Gore's TV network back when that was on air. Um, and I was sort of like a full-time staffer there. So I had a salary and I got to do whatever I wanted. Um, and then my most recent project was an idea that I sold to a media company. Um, 
And so, you know, like a lot of my prior to launching this Kickstarter campaign, a lot of my day to day work involves coming up with ideas and then like pitching them in hopes that somebody bites, whether it's a media company or a TV network or what have you. Um, and that's cool. That's like just the way the business works, you know, that I have found myself uh, in. But um, but when I stumbled upon this idea for brain health and, and you know, Alzheimer's prevention and the like, uh, I really felt that it was an idea far too important to leave to the TV pitch meetings that I was having at the time or the, you know, like, I just, I did, you know, when you work with a media company, for example, like I did for Acting Disruptive with AOL, I mean, there are so many cooks in the kitchen. You know, Acting Disruptive is a great representation of, of how I wanted it to look. But I really wanted this documentary to be, I wanted to call the shots on it. You know, I wanted to get to interview the people that I wanted to interview. I wanted it to not sort of, you know, dumb down the content. I wanted it to take a bold stance, a possibly controversial stance. Um, and so, yeah, so why did I decide to, to kickstart it? Well, it turns out raising money for a documentary is incredibly difficult. Um, you know, very few documentaries actually become profitable. Uh, and so for me, again, you know, I felt like the idea was way too important. And, it, it, you know, ultimately it's an idea so much bigger than myself that I felt like, you know, my head is so much in the world of new media these days. And everybody I know is like running Kickstarter campaigns. And I, I really feel like, it's the way for artists to fund their work today, really, and in the future, because the, the, the creative middle class is dwindling, you know, and getting smaller and smaller by the day. So um, so even though I'm well versed in the virtues of, of crowdfunding, uh, I'd never done one. And so I was like, OK, this is the perfect project, really, for me to, like, try this out. Um, you know, and I, I kind of approached it like one of those trust you know, corporate like trust exercises where they like, you know, they ask you to like fall back and see if somebody's there to, you know, in hopes that somebody's there to catch you. And obviously there's always somebody there to catch you, but that's kind of how I approached it. And uh, obviously not knowing who, dude, I mean, seriously, like I, you know, it was just complete uncertainty and the feedback that I've gotten and the results, obviously of the campaign have just been better than anything I could have dreamed for. So I'm just so thrilled. Well, I you know I think it fits um, you know your your makeup because it really you know crowdfunding is disrupting um, venture capital, um, film fundraising, um, all sorts of say traditional means of of raising capital to bring your idea to fruition, and this idea of this absolute transparency of kind of putting yourself out there, telling you story, telling your story, and then waiting for the donations to start coming in and the contributions to come in for your project is is yeah. disruptive and and it's got to be a little harrowing at the same time it's harrowing but it's again like it was the most exhilarating wonderful process because you really see first of all how generous people are i mean people that i've never met in person contributing thousands of dollars to this project I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing, you know, and, um, and wonderful and, and just incredible in so many ways, you know, having people go out of their way, taking time to write paragraphs, you know, posting my link on Facebook and then, you know, sending me messages about the experiences, you know, with this topic that they've had in their own lives. And, you know, I felt it was just humbling and, and amazing. And, you know, I just feel very, very proud that, uh, that the community that's now, you know, about 2000 people strong has invested that kind of faith in me. And so I, you know, I fully intend to deliver on the promise. So it's, it's been awesome. So, you know, when you went to school, you, you didn't go with eyes on being a filmmaker. If I understand correctly, correctly, you were a biology major uh, when you started (laughs) college with aspirations to practice medicine. Uh, What was the impetus for, for you to change your path to uh, study film? Wow, you must have done your research because I don't even know where that, like where that's written. That's really that's impressive. Um, yeah, so I started college and I was a biology major, um, and uh, yeah, I knew that I loved health and I knew that I loved medicine, um, 
sorry if you hear an, like an ambulance in the background. I'm in Manhattan, which can be noisy. Uh, I don't know if you're picking up on that, but yeah, we. Um, yeah. How apropos? How apropos? It's a right? Regular town, um, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, so I I've always loved health and medicine. Actually, when I was in high school, I was I for a little while I was obsessed with virology. I read The Hot Zone by Richard Preston, which is all about Ebola, and uh, and I was obsessed with the study of virology. But then my interest. Uh, veered more towards um, sports medicine. I was really into the way our diets sort of affect, you know, physical performance and body composition. Um, my senior high school thesis paper was actually on creatine. I wrote a paper on creatine. It was like a 10-page opus. <laughs> um, and uh, and then, so yeah, so I went to college to major in biology. Um, and Somewhere along, you know, somewhere along the undergraduate route, I realized this love of storytelling and creativity and um, and artistry. And, you know, I was always really into music. Um, music has been a very powerful uh, and, you know, influential uh, medium for me. Um, and so I, you know, I wanted to sort of try my hand at music. So I like wanted to make sure that I had the time to learn to play guitar. Um, and I was really into cinema at the time. And, uh, and you know, narrative filmmaking really sort of inspired me. I was, you know, I, in high school, became obsessed with, um, you know, American Beauty and Fight Club and things like that that were very sort of formative to me. And so rather than, I just felt like my ultimate happiness was not going to come from locking myself up in academia 24-7. It was... I wanted my life to, you know, be sort of more of a tapas bar of ideas than, you know, a sort of one study thing that you sort of need to embrace, you know, if you're going to make it in academia. And so I ended up double majoring in film and psychology. So that's what I, I ended up graduating with a, with a double degree in film and psychology. Um, and that led to me getting this crazy job hosting and producing content for Al Gore's TV network uh, in 2005. It's quite a path. So, yeah. you know, we we take this, you know, interest in health and sports medicine. And I, I think thinking about your high school uh, paper on creatine, 10 pages, <laughs> you yeah. obviously, you know, go deep when you do. Um, yeah. Tell, you know, tell me, what was the inspiration for you to make Breadhead? Well, like you just said, uh, when I, when my interest becomes piqued by something, whether it's music or creatine or whatever, I become relentlessly curious and, um, I almost can't sleep until I feel like I know as much as I can know about any you know, given, given topic, whether it's music, whether it's, uh, filmmaking, um, that's just sort of a pattern that I've seen in my own life. And so, uh, it was about the time um, that I was wrapping up production on Acting Disruptive that my, well, actually I should I should go back a little further. About about a year before I began production on Acting Disruptive, my mom started showing signs of cognitive decline, um, and uh, she also started showing symptoms that were more sort of indicative of some kind of like movement you know, disorder, I, like a Parkinson, features that were more Parkinsonian in nature, but, you know, movement disorders don't typically present with cognitive dysfunction. So, um, and so there was like this whole battery of symptoms that she started seeing all at once. And at first I didn't even, you know, me and my two younger brothers, we didn't even take her seriously because I have no sort of prior family history of anything like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or anything like that. So, um, so we, you know, we had no idea what it was. And uh, for a little while, we thought that she was just kind of like attention seeking. Because again, my mom was like young. So like, what the, f you know, nobody would expect a woman who's 59 to start, sh you know, showing signs of cognitive decline, especially because my mom had always been a really sharp woman. You know, she was very, always just very sort of uh, outgoing, talkative on top of her game. She, you know, she ran a company for, you know, the majority of my upbringing. So um, so at that time, uh, you know, my mom, I grew up in Manhattan, so my mom has access to, 
you know, NYU, which is right here, and then, you know, a bunch of other sort of hospitals in the city. But we couldn't really find a, a clear diagnosis for what she had, why she was experiencing these symptoms. And so not being in production at that time, I had the, the time, thankfully, to go with her to various hospitals around the country in search of answers. And um, and so what I saw, uh, you know, during that time was very much, you know, they describe the field of n- neurology in medical school, I've heard, as being one characterized by diagnose and adios. Because unless you're like the doctor that's actually like doing surgery, um, there's very little that neurologists in the, in the past could really do when you present with these kinds of neurodegenerative diseases, um, whether it's Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, what have you, other than prescribed drugs, which, you know, barely work in many cases. So that was very unsettling to me. Um, and I also became very, you know, like I said, I, I started just the, the curiosity wouldn't lose its wouldn't loosen its grip over me that there could be something larger at play here with my mom because she's young and because I don't really I didn't have a sense of any kind of like family history of of these diseases so I started just digging into the research um and you know a couple years before that I you know I remember seeing Terry Wall's TED talk minding your mitochondria which is something that I kind of just put in my back pocket at the time that I saw it uh And um, I came across this interesting insight in the New York Times that a researcher at Brown University uh, came to, and she saw striking similarities between the neurons of people with Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetics. Um, That struck me as a really, you know, mind-blowing, powerful uh, idea. And, um, And then, you know, I stumbled on, you know, Grain Brain in those early months, which is, um, you know, obviously the book by, by David Perlmutter. Uh, and so I just, I started really sort of like trying to figure out all the ways that sort of the environment, you know, the, the factors that were within, what did my mom do wrong that would have led to a woman that was, you know, affluent, had access to healthy food, thought that she was eating healthy her whole life, could have, could have led to a woman like this to have become you know, demented, you know, even in the absence of any kind of diagnosis. uh, I focused on dementia. I focused on Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. And what you learn, you know, the deeper down the rabbit hole you go with these sorts of diseases is that they share many sort of common features. And, um, and so I just became focused on, on Alzheimer's, you know, and my mom has a little bit of these like movement symptoms as well. And so that's, you know, ever present. Uh, and that's definitely challenging, but, um, but yeah, so I, I, I came across all these insights and then I, I stumbled on it. You know, it was just one thing after another. I came across the idea that for a subset of people that, that will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease, it's actually potentially preventable. And as somebody who's like very much, you know, a compulsive Googler, you know, somebody who's very science minded, that was a revolutionary idea to me because the way I think about Alzheimer's disease or the way, the way I did think about Alzheimer's disease is something that's like you either get it or you don't, whether or not you do is largely up to chance. Uh, Chances are if you're old, you're going to get it. Um, There's very little that you can do to affect your odds one way or the other. and I also didn't really realize that what we do day to day has an effect on our brain health. You know, I know that like we have, we can go to the doctor and check our blood pressure and our cholesterol and things like that. We can kind of have a handle on how our, you know, cardiovascular health is going, but brain health is not something that really occurred to me. Um, and so I just became obsessed with all these ideas and these insights about modifying your risk and the connection between, you know, Alzheimer's and type two diabetes. Um, and I was just like, Oh my God, I gotta, I gotta amplify this message, you know? Well, it's an important message to amplify. And and I want to go back to your mom. Um, You know, in the breadhead trailer, there's a moment where you're in a hospital room and you're asking your mom, Kathy, if she knows where she is. And as a son, uh, I, I am trying to sit in your shoes and think about how painful it is that she doesn't know where she's at 
in that moment. Yeah. And, you know, so so I think, and I, I think of it, you know, those that are joining us tonight, you know, what were those first signs that you saw in your mom that she was changing? You know, you, you mentioned some motor difficulties and some other cognitive things. What what specifically did you start seeing? Was it a, a personality change? Was it was it memory? Um, what what was going on? It was very simple, like cognitive stuff. There there was one moment in particular that uh, that I remember as sort of being that sort of turning point for me. Um, we were, the whole family was in Miami. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Miami. My dad lives down there and my mom and my dad are amicable. So we were all together and she said to all, we were all in the living room of my dad's house. And she said that she didn't know what year it was. Um, wow. And we thought, yeah. And we thought that she was messing with us, honestly. So we were like, we, you know, we, we were not taking her seriously in that moment. And she became so frustrated by that, and so upset that we weren't, that we didn't believe her, um, that she started crying. And at that moment, I realized that this was like something real, you know. Um, and then, also around that time, we were starting to realize that that her gait was a little different, you know. Right. Um, and so the, the confluence of, of those things just, you know, I mean, I went from a point of like complete ignorance about neurodegenerative disease and not, I didn't even know that, I mean, I didn't know what Parkinson's was. I didn't know that, that there was a tiny region of the brain responsible for your movement that, you know, that degrades and that's what Parkinson's, like I had no, I, had, I knew nothing. And so, um, and yeah, and so the, after that, because I had the time, I think we went back to New York and then, you know, we visited her doctor at NYU. They didn't really know what it was. And we booked a, a trip soon after that to the Cleveland Clinic, actually. So we went to the, to the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and that was when they first started using terms like Parkinson's and dementia and stuff like that. And that was actually when they prescribed for the first time a, uh, like a memory drug. So, and that was a really stressful time in my life. I, you know, I, I've been exceedingly lucky in my life and, you know, I'm born and raised in Manhattan, you know, went to good schools and whatnot. So I've, I didn't, I had not prior to that moment experienced, uh, panic the way I did at that at that time and but then after the dust sort of settled on that you know I uh I used my sort of my love of science my my penchant for you know reading research and um and you know googling you know long articles that might be boring for others uh to try to connect the dots um and uh and so it was you know it was at once upsetting but um but then i felt empowered because i knew that you know if anybody was going to like come to some sort of understanding about the you know the underlying pathology that my mom was experiencing and and, and you know be able to sort of wrap their head around it outside of the the clinic you know it would be me and so, um, and so, yeah, so that's when I just, I became obsessed with the topic. And then at some point in there, I, you know, I came up with this idea for acting disruptive. I sold that to AOL, they funded it. And so that, you know, took up a good, you know, six months of my life. And I was living in LA at the time, but all the while I was just like, when I was not working on that project, I was like literally just Googling neuroscience. That's literally all I was doing. Uh, you know, at that time. And as soon as that production wrapped, I moved back to New York um, to to help out with my mom. And it was around that time that I came up with the idea for Breadhead. So, you know, like, obviously, I, I think that, that guys like David Perlmutter, Terry Walls are, are amazing thought leaders. And I, you know, I look up to them so much. But 
what I what I hope to bring to the to the table is you know getting this message out to a younger audience because what I found is that changes begin in the brain way earlier than the arrival of that first symptom, and so you know I picked up Green Brain because I you know I have a unique interest in this topic I have a vested interest because of my mom, um, but I think that a lot of millennials you know people that were born in the 80s and 90s are going through this for the first time. The oldest millennial now is 35. So, so this is an idea that, um, that I think is profoundly important. And, you know, and so that's, that's really what I hope to do. I hope to just explore the science, present it in a way that's, you know, that, that is accurate. Uh, and, yeah, and then try to make a difference. You know, I'm trying very hard with my mom, but it's difficult to undo, you know, decades of dietary dogma. And so, you know, that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, well, uh, on, on the dietary dogma, right, you you mentioned yeah. that mom thought she ate a great diet. You know, I, and I'm, yeah. I'm picturing the food the food pyramid that I grew up and you grew up seeing in classrooms, right? Was yeah. that her yeah. idea of a, of a healthy diet? Yeah, I mean, you right, know, grains like, right on I, top of the the chart. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't even it wasn't even whole grains, honestly. Like I, that's what that's what I brought to the table before I realized that you know eating copious whole grains is not the best choice for health either. Like we, you know, growing up in my house, there was always you know pasta. None of us are overweight, but um, there was always pasta. I remember there was margarine in my house. Um, oh, yes, margarine. I remember. I, yeah, I remember that, you know, when my when my mom gave me, I don't know how old I was, but when she gave me my first sort of omelet, uh, she told me that it's the, it's the kind of thing that you only want to eat once a week because, you know, the cholesterol is bad for your heart, clogs your arteries. Um, and, you know, I've always, I've always been into health. So for as long as I can remember, I was trying to sort of tinker with my diet and to see, you know, various things like, I, you know, I think I was in high school and I tried my first sort of like ketogenic diet. I stumbled upon a book by Lyle McDonald. There's a book out there called The Ketogenic Diet, which is like a really sort of heady, sciencey book. Uh, I bought that when I was like in 11th grade. Um, but, but yeah, my mom, you know, we, we shopped at, at you know, supermarkets in Manhattan and, and we had lots of salads and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, like she wasn't, it turns out that whatever she thought was healthy was really not. And, you know, she also comes from a generation that didn't really embrace exercise the way I feel like my generation does. I mean, you know, public gyms, like, you know, didn't proliferate until the eighties and nineties. Um, you know, exercise was never a big part of my mom's life or my dad's. And, you know, we know now how beneficial, you know, physical exercise is for brain health. So, uh, you know, and my mom retired very early. Um, she, you know, it's just been a really interesting sort of realization of like all these different things that my mom could have done different, you know, and I'm very cautious. I don't want to say that if she did any one thing differently, she wouldn't have, you know, had these symptoms. So I want to, you know, and for people that are, that have family mem members that are suffering with Alzheimer's and things like that, I don't want to, um, you know, my, I don't want any, anybody to think that there's one smoking gun, you know, there's one thing that their parents could have done or should have done differently that would have prevented these awful diseases. You know, they're very, these are very complicated diseases, but, um, but, you know, I, I don't think that we're in the dark. And so whatever it is that a brain healthy lifestyle is, I mean, I think that we know more about it today than we ever have before. And so I don't want to wait until there's a, you know, a consensus wait until, you know, every five years, there's another USDA, you know, recommended dietary recommendations panel for Americans. Like, I think that like, we need to make changes today. And so that's what that's what this is all about, really. Well, you know, and, and I think you bring up something, you know, important for the, the millennial generation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that is that for the 30-somethings of today, they need to look toward their own brain health, but they're also faced with the future of their own parents. And yeah. 
take taking care of them and myself as a Gen Xer, I'm 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 in the same place, right? So mm-hmm. we can have these two generations that are facing issues we never did before and we, we have to think about our parents' generation and, and also realize, you know, the environmental changes that have happened in their lifetime, the fact that processed food was introduced into the American diet. Um, yeah. There, there are so many factors that are that impinge on on these issues, not just for brain health, but for heart health, uh, for cancer risk, and you know there are a number of things that predispose us. You know, we've seen a, a huge increase in autism diagnosis and you know other cognitive issues in children. So it's not just adults; it's it's our kids that we're looking at. And, you know, I, I know through this process for you, Max, that you've taken some steps to control your own brain fitness. Can you talk a little bit about your personal health regime today? Yeah, well, you know, I definitely love to exercise. I, I hate running. I hate cardio. But I've found a form of cardio that works for me. I like the elliptical. <laughs> yeah. So I do that. You know, you got you to find what works for you and do it. Absolutely. Um, I enjoy yoga. I love lifting weights. Um, I've always been a bit of a gym junkie. You know, I really enjoy it. I don't meditate, but working out is very meditative for me. Um, although I should meditate. Meditation has profound brain benefits, which we could go into if you want. Um, but so, you know, I, I love exercise. Exercise has so many, you know, beneficial aspects to it. Um, Aside from promoting, you know, insulin sensitivity, uh, you know, it releases all kinds of neurotrophic growth factors in the brain, like BDNF. Just doing aerobic exercise releases a, a protein that's been dubbed the miracle growth for the brain, which can actually cause the proliferation of new brain cells in the hippocampus, which is the first structure to be damaged in, in Alzheimer's disease. So I think exercise is huge. I go to the gym right. now. Exercise thinking, yeah. improves memory if you're getting, you know, what, yeah. what are the recommendations now? 20 minutes of aerobic exercise five days a week or, or so it is enough to increase B, BDNF. Yes, yes. So, and, and, and that's exciting, right? Because most, most people can manage to, to fit that into their, into their day if they can develop the, uh, the healthy habit. Yeah. But but in, if in addition I, you know, to... You know, exercise, um, I, I understood that you were involved in a Alzheimer's prevention program. Can you, can you touch a bit about, touch on that just a little bit? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm lucky enough to live in Manhattan, and there is an Alzheimer's prevention clinic uh, here in the city. And I came across it, and I <laughs> made an appointment for myself because I'm just, you know, I want to know as much about my own biology as I can. So I made an appointment and um, turns out it's not very often that, you know, 30 somethings with zero symptoms are making appointments to see, you know, Alzheimer's neurologists, you know, neurologists. Yeah. So, um, so I made an appointment and I learned all these like interesting things about myself uh, and ways that I could, you know, enhance my own, Brain health, I think the term is minimize risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, uh, and so because that was so, such a unique move, um, NBC Nightly News caught wind of it, and they did this really great piece uh, where I was interviewed by Dr. Nancy Snyderman, and then the Wall Street Journal did this incredible piece. So, um, so yeah, so diet-wise, um, You know, I've adopted a low-carbohydrate diet. Um, I think that there are enough signs pointing to the importance of glucose to brain health uh, that I feel that the best way to sort of stay as insulin-sensitive as as possible, which is the inverse of insulin resistance, which is the hallmark of type 2 diabetes, the best best diet for me to sort of do that uh, is a low sort of carbohydrate diet. so I also kind of like a, the, a paleo friendly direction. Yeah, I don't use the term paleo because, uh, well, one of the reasons is I love peanut too much, but um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a pretty it's a pretty pure lifestyle, so I I, I could appreciate that. 
Yeah, but I do like a lot of what the paleo diet offers. You know, the whole philosophy about um, um, absconding uh, processed foods to me, obviously, it's a no, it's a no brainer, no pun intended. Um, so yeah, so my diet is, is pretty, it looks pretty much like that. I mean, I, I used to believe that the more whole grains you ate, the better your health. You know, I used to walk into a Whole Foods and see a grain bar and be like, oh my God, this is so healthy. Let's load up on the brown rice and the farro and the quinoa. And I realized that's not really the case. So um, I try to favor healthful fats in my diet. The one diet that the, mo- that the most robust body of research uh, exists to show can for sure delay cognitive decline is the Mediterranean diet. Um, right. And so, and I think that the Mediterranean diet is an, obviously an incredible diet. You know, it offers all kinds of great things like the ability to drink, you know, red wine. Um, but I've chosen to modify it even more because obviously the Mediterranean diet includes whole grain. Um, but, and this is just my own sort of, you know, deductive reasoning. If you look at any sort of diet, the one sort of cost prohibitive macronutrient, you know, the three macronutrients are fat, carbohydrates, and protein. The cost prohibitive one is the lean protein. So I'm an omnivore. I eat, you know, meat. Um, and so I'm not going to alter that for the most part. Um, Fat is very important. You know, fat is essential. We need to consume fat. Our brains are made of fat. Uh, but there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. So I think that there's leeway with the amount of carbohydrates that people uh, actually need to consume. I think that the, that the real requirement for most people uh, living our sort of modern, fairly sedentary lives, is pretty small, our carbohydrate requirements. So I've sort of modified the Mediterranean diet for myself to be even lower in carbohydrates. and um, And it's done pretty well for me. I find myself able to go long periods without eating. I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. uh, And I don't get the same kind of hanger that I used to when I was consuming copious whole grains. You know, like hanger is like this hybrid of like being hungry and angry, which I would get when my blood sugar would would go really low. But because I have sort of gotten past that low-carb flu that a lot of people talk about, and I now, you know, as a whole for, you know, generally speaking, I I eat low carb every day. I can wait until two in the afternoon to have my first meal and enjoy all the benefits of intermittent fasting if I want. Uh, And I feel completely fine. In fact, I feel great. My cognition just feels spot on. If I have an important meeting and it's around the time of like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., noon, maybe one, I actually won't eat anything before that meeting so that I can be like as sharp as I, you know, as possible. So, so I mean you're you're super attuned to you know how yeah. how the foods you're taking are affecting you and I I imagine working you know, with a physician in the program that you're in that you've you've done blood work and in other measures to kind of understand where where your levels are and and do you monitor monitor those on an ongoing basis to kind of dial dial things in and see where supplementation is needed do you find that useful Um yeah I you know, I had an elevated uh, homocysteine level. That was the amino acid that they were referencing in that NBC Nightly News piece. Um, having elevated homocysteine is a risk factor for all kinds of, you know, degenerative disease, chronic, you know, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's. Um, and the reason why I had that uh, elevation of, of homocysteine is because I happen to have a mutation on a gene that means that I don't metabolize B vitamins as well as the majority. Um, and so I started taking a very special form of these B vitamins to sort of bypass my, to bypass my handicapped metabolic pathway. Um, and that homocysteine level went down. So, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I think everybody should check. I think people should be uh, hyper attuned to their blood sugar. They can check things like their glycated hemoglobin, um, that's sort of like a running three month average of their blood sugar. Uh, There's, you know, there's a lot of things that people can check. Um, It's just our, our primary care doctors checking these sorts of things, looking out for things that might present brain risk. I don't know. And that's what I have to change. 
Well, right. That's that's the challenge. We don't all have a David Perlmutter in our backyard that we can go yeah. to. And right. Plus, everyone wants to fly to Naples, Florida, to uh, to his clinic. Um, you know, I I myself and family members have cardiac risk factors, uh, which mm. which obviously we we also know are are Alzheimer's risk factors. And you know, yeah. finding a a medical doctor uh, that can do the blood work, that can do the hormone checks, um, look at thyroid levels, and and really dial these things in is very, very difficult yeah. to do. And, you know, I, I've taken much of the approach that you have uh, because of those risk factors and for four years have been seeing an osteopathic physician, and every six months I have a very complex blood workup done to monitor my levels so I see what's happening with diet, with exercise, and supplementation in order to kind of dial mm-hmm. these things in. Um, yeah. it, these these docs aren't easily accessible. So, you know, for those that are looking for help, you know, how are you guiding them? I, I imagine people are coming to you and saying, Max, where do I go? <laughs> what do I look for? Yeah. Where yeah, I mean... <laughs> Wait to see the film. Um, no, I mean, you know, I I like to sort of highlight the science that I think is really interesting and empowering. So, you know, I'm very active on social media. Um, you know, I th- you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So I, you know, I, I try my best to sort of get people excited about the possibility that they might ultimately be the ones to take the reins of their own health, you know. Um, not everybody obviously has been touched by dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cardiovascular disease. Uh, so not everybody is going to be, is going to feel like it's, it's as relevant to them. You know, these, these really interesting insights and studies that, that come out by the day, it seems. But, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's ultimately up to people to make decisions in their own life day to day that uh is gonna you know either enhance or be deleterious to their health you know um i just it's like maslow's hierarchy of needs you know like i know a lot of people are obsessing over this like the gmo debate is a really big thing people are freaking out about it um the value, there's all these like health things that are like such hot button topics today but meanwhile like most of the people that are like doing the debating their their diets are not really that great, you know? And I, I have no statistics to reference at all, but I'm like, you know, I think that we need to like, look at what we're actually consuming because food is information. And, you know, whether or not you're eating like a tortilla chip that's made of GMO corn or, you know, organic non-GMO corn, we're eating too many tortilla chips, you know? So, so that's just my thing. It's getting, it's, in, it's inspiring people to sort of, you know, take a closer look at the things that, that are, you know, passing their lips and uh, getting people to think differently about food because it really is, it is software. Food is software for the body. You know, we might have outdated hardware to interpret the software, uh, which is problematic and inconvenient, but nonetheless, we still need to look at our food as software and, you know, because it sucks getting sick. And, you know, once you're sick, especially with one of these... Yeah, yeah. It does suck getting sick. Yeah, well, you know, let's yeah. delve more into the software a little bit more, Max. You know, we we keep hearing more and more that that carbs, most specifically from bread, pasta, corn, processed and refined foods, are bad for the gut and the brain. Mm-hmm. You know, in your invest in your investigations, what does the science tell us is specifically happening in the brain when we're taking in the bad carbs? You know, what's going on? Yeah. Well, when you consume any kind of carbohydrate, they get broken down into glucose. And so they, they flood your system with blood sugar. And some carbs do it less intensely than others. That's what the glycemic index is all about. So, you know, there's pure glucose, which has a glycemic index of 100. And then you've got whole grain bread, for example, which has a glycemic index on average of around 70. Um, so regardless of the kind of carbohydrate, when you eat it, it goes into your blood as glucose. And then your pancreas secretes insulin, which is sort of like the hormone that alerts your cells to the fact that there's food in the blood fresh for the taking. Um, and your cells use glucose for fuel. But the problem, you know, arises when we consume too many carbohydrates and, you know, 
like any drug, we sort of become resistant to its effects after a while, you know, um, the same way that when you drink alcohol after a while, you need, you know, more and more and more of it to get the same buzz that you were getting, you know, freshman year of college. Um, the same thing happens with insulin. Now, it turns out that the brain is an incredibly metabolically hungry organ. It uses 20% of your base metabolic rate, and it uses primarily glucose for fuel. So this idea of insulin resistance um, has profound implications on brain health, and you can be insulin resistant. You can show signs of insulin resistance anywhere in your body, even in the absence of a type 2 diabetes diagnosis. Um, and it, it seems that, you know, that this sort of insulin resistance, this impaired glucose metabolism, uh, could be a pathology that predates a lot of these sort of symptoms that, that, that arise from Alzheimer's disease. It could be why, you know, these cells are not cleaning the amyloid beta plaque properly from the brain just because they're not functioning as well. Um, in fact, there was a trial recently uh, led by Suzanne Kraft, who I'm speaking with next week, I'm so excited, um, where she gave people with Alzheimer's uh, disease intranasal insulin, and they showed an improvement in cognition, you know, the same way that a diabetic takes a shot of insulin because they need to clear their sugar of blood, their, their uh, blood of sugar, sorry. Um, they gave this sort of, you know, insulin nasal spray to people with Alzheimer's disease, and it increased the uptake of glucose to a point where there was a, a significant improvement in cognitive function. So, Amazing. yeah. So, um, so I think that, you know, again, that, that's a hypothesis and, you know, I fear that I'm going to oversimplify Alzheimer's disease, but it is a very, um, it's a hypothesis that really the vanguard of neurology, especially thinking about ways of preventing Alzheimer's, because God knows, I mean, trial after trial of finding a cure has just been like just utter letdowns. And we need to find a cure, but I don't think that we should sit idly until we get to one. Um, this sort of like metabolic basis for, for neuronal dysfunction seems more and more to, you know, more and more roads seem to be pointing in that, in that direction. In fact, there was a recent article um, in the Harvard Gazette, I think I posted it on the Breadhead Facebook page, uh, that this is really a new way of thinking about Alzheimer's. And you've got, you know, researchers like Suzanne DeLamonte at, you know, Brown coining the term type 3 diabetes and Suzanne Kraft, who, you know, appears in her work to be approaching, you know, Alzheimer's as, a, as sort of a metabolic problem. Um, and so, you know, that's all this sort of insulin resistance type 2 diabetes thing, I mean, it, it comes from just eating too many carbohydrates. It comes from decades of believing that, you know, the USDA food pyramid was the way to eat. And so, you know, that's just, that's, that's the hypothesis. And I think it's a powerful one. And I think it's, I really think it's, I don't know. I think that we're going to see, we're going to hear more and more about this sort of food brain connection as time goes on. And so I just want to track it for myself for my mom and for, for everybody out there, you know? Well, I, you know, I think you're right that, you know, prevention is the new frontier and, and, you know, naturally we need to be, you know, looking at diet with 5 million Americans suffering with Alzheimer's and numbers expected to triple by 2050 and no known cure. Um, you know, the scientific community has got to be looking in other directions. In, in terms of what we can do to stop the progression of this and other neuro, neurodegenerative diseases, you know. So yeah. as as we you know as we speak about that, um, yeah, it's safe to say that the foods we eat affect our gene expression. So it would mean that it's plausible that we could optimize our nutrition based on our genetic makeup. So the the more we know about our our personal genome. Uh, the the better we can you know dial in our our diet you know last month I interviewed a neuroscientist Dr Jay Lombard who uh, oh yeah I love him had, had, uh, I know, you know him. And Jay yeah, and you know Jay's work at Genomind and you know they're yeah. doing you know personalized medicine and psychiatry based on you know individuals genetic makeup so that we you know better understand you know what the markers are. Um, that are going to indicate what treatment may be most beneficial for someone. And I think we can, you know, look toward dialing in our diet 
much in the same way. So as we so as we talk about that, and we, you know, every day we're we're reading red wine is good for you, red wine is bad for you, too much coffee <laughs> is awful. No, five cups of coffee a day is going to you know extend your life by ten years. <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> You know, we're we're getting you know all kinds of conflicting information, but you know overall, I, I think we're seeing trends toward certain foods that are good for our brain health. You know, so right now, if you think of your your top five favorites uh, that are in your your diet today, why why are they in your diet, and what are they? That's a great question. Well, I think uh, coconut oil is definitely a staple. I try to get like a tablespoon of that every day because coconut oil is made of a kind of fat. Um, it's a very special kind of fat called a medium chain triglyceride. Uh, and that sort of provides the body with ketones, which are for you to sort of have ketones circulating freely in the absence of things like, you know, dietary sources like coconut oil, you would need to be in ketosis, which is a, you know, you can get to by avoiding all carbohydrates, and that's when your body sorts of, sort of sort of dips into your fat stores for fuel, and that your brain is able to, your brain is able to use ketones um, as an alternate fuel source to glucose. But you can also, without being in ketosis, supply your brain with ketones by consuming coconut oil. And medium chain triglycerides have been studied, uh, and they have shown you know to be really great for people with mild cognitive impairment, um, Alzheimer's. Uh, and so I think that's a really great fat for the brain. Um, you know, it lets your sort of neurons operate more like a super high-tech hybrid. That's how I visualize it. Than like one of these gas guzzlers, you know. Um, let, it, it, you know, letting it's, your it's the Tesla of <laughs> exactly, yeah. So so I kind of like uh, my neuron. I like to keep my neurons on their toes, so to speak. Right. Um, so yeah, so I, I so co- like coconut, oil. coconut oil comes out first. What's second on your list? I like green tea a lot. Um, green tea is a staple uh, in animal models. They've shown green tea to um, be very beneficial uh, for brain health. Sort of undoes a lot of the pathology related to, to Alzheimer's disease. Modulates the, the, the entanglement of the tau protein. Um, in Alzheimer's brains. It also imp- increase, improves working memory, which is great. So if I have like a, you know, something that I need to memorize for any particular reason, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm consuming a lot of green tea. Um, and then there's the, the theanine in green tea, which is a, a really potent nootropic, which basically improves cognitive function even in normal people. It, it boosts alpha waves in the brain, which is... Um, sort of like a, the brain wave that's most prevalent during periods of relaxation, but it doesn't sedate you. It works synergistically with caffeine. So it's really, green tea is a wonderful beverage. It's no, you know, it's no wonder it's one of the world's most popular beverages. So I drink a lot of that. Um, I like blueberries. You know, you were talking about BDNF before. Blueberries have been shown to in, in, increase BDNF, which is a neurotrophic factor that promotes neurogenesis. It, it ensures the survival of existing neurons. So I try to eat, you know, lots of blueberries. Uh, I've got two more, right? I like grass-fed You've got, you've got red... two more. You, you picked three. Yeah. I'm a big fan of grass-fed red meat. I have to say it doesn't taste as good to me as, you know, a grain-fed steak that you get in a restaurant. But grass-fed meat is actually, unlike grain-fed meat, a source of omega-3s, which, right. you know, are very good for you. They're anti-inflammatory. You know, they, the DHA fat um, makes up a lot of the, you know, cell membranes in our brains. So there's that. Not, not easy and, to get uh, grass-fed red meat, though. You know, we, uh, yeah, it's, we're it's here in Utah, side. and and people are, are amazed when they come to visit because you look out our office windows, and uh, we've got a, a great herd of uh, grass-fed cattle. <laughs> really? We're, and uh, you know we know right where the source is, but not everyone has uh, has that so convenient. So it it can be tough to get, and and it's expensive, and uh, it is yeah, required yeah. taste. But boy, does it feel different when you when you eat that grass fed meat. Yeah, you feel you feel a lot better. And um, yeah. yeah, you know I live in Manhattan, so I'm lucky. It's it's pretty easy to come by. It is expensive, and I found that the best place to get it is at Trader Joe's. The prices there are great. Um, Great and so I consume, yeah, so I, I eat a lot of uh, grass-fed meat. 
And then for my yeah, one, fifth, one left on your list. Yeah, well, last but certainly not least is olive oil. I've actually recent, very recently become obsessed with this compound that a month ago, you know, you would ask me what it was, I would have no idea. It's, it's that compound in extra virgin olive oil responsible for the, that peppery taste at the back yeah. of your throat. It's called oleocanthal. And it's supposed to be incredible for you. It like clears the brain of amyloid plaque and animal models again. Um, you know, it's no secret that olive oil is a mainstay of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and so I think that, um, that oleocanthal uh, is a really, really fantastic like it's, it, it almost like to me feels like the the next resveratrol you know a lot of people were really excited about resveratrol for a long time that that antioxidant and red, red wine that people right. thought was like the fountain of youth oleocanthal has been shown to selectively uh induce cell death in cancer cells tumor cells um which is really really fascinating and amazing um and so these are all the kinds of things where like you know, all the the foods that I've listed, like, they're all delicious and safe and have, you know, just ample evidence to show that they're that they're good for you. So I have no qualms about uh, suggesting that everybody go out and consume them because they're they they're very good for you. Very good for brain health. No, you, you don't have to deprive yourself to eat brain healthy foods. And I, I think that's often a, a misnomer. I mean, dark chocolate, avocados, coffee, red yeah, wine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all well, I do. I do think that we delicious. need to deprive ourselves of sugar. And you know, as somebody who has a sweet Thank tooth, you. yeah, I can certainly say that that we are definitely programmed to seek out sweet tasting things. And you know, I love a cupcake, you know, as much as the next person. But um, but I do think that we need to hack our biology in the sense that you know. Our, our physiology tells us that we want something, but we need to be like, no, we're going to be better off without it. Because, you know, again, this our, our hardware, we evolved at a time when, you know, sugar was really hard to come by. You know, nature did not make it easy for us to come by sugar. I mean, fruit was only available seasonally. And, you know, there was honey, but honey was guarded by bees. And today, sugar is everywhere. It's insidious. It's in everything. You know, one tablespoon of ketchup has like a teaspoon of sugar. So I think that that's, I think that, you know, I think sugar is really toxic. And, and so I think that that's the one thing that we need to abstain from, even if it's kind of a bummer to have to do so. Yeah, no, I uh, wholeheartedly agree. And, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, the, the food that we're that we're taking in. What role does music uh, play in preserving our cognitive health? Music is amazing. I mean, not only like playing music for one is just incredible because it involves such a concert of, you know, sensory input, behavioral output. It engages so many different parts of your brain um, that, you know, that has definitely been proven to delay cognitive decline, just playing a musical instrument, even picking it up at midlife. Um, but then listening to music as well is very beneficial because it, again, it activates parts of the brain that are like not just limited to language, you know? Um, it's a really interesting thing. I mean, I was reading something, I can't remember exactly what you actually, you, I'm sure you know this better than I do, but um, that infants can recognize melodies um, way, way, way earlier than they actually can recognize language because. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they and tune so right into the rhythm that they're that they they're tune, experiencing in utero. Uh, it's the first yeah. form of learning. It, it, it's very, it's very powerful. And I, I know you're a musician. You're a singer songwriter. I've, I've listened to some of your music and thoroughly enjoy it. So you know, you get to have a form of entertainment and do something good for your brain at the same time. Oh, absolutely. And music also boosts BDNF, which is just fascinating. Um. So, yeah, so music is great. I, I'm a big fan of music. There was a documentary that came out last year about uh, music and Alzheimer's. I, I forget I forget what, what the name is. It eludes me. But. Uh, well, Alive Inside. And, Alive Inside, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, the big program uh, that's running actually in, in New York with Conchetta 
uh, Tomeno and uh, the organization Music and Memory, uh, run by Dan Cohen, uh, also, mm-hmm. also there in New York. They're they're doing amazing work of using you know personalized music to help bring back you know memory for those suffering from dementia. It it's very powerful. You know, Max, yeah. we've just got a couple minutes left. I, I'm interested to know, you know, what's next in your process to complete, you know, Breadhead? What, what's ahead and when can we look for it in theaters? Well, we're starting shooting actually tomorrow. I have a shoot set up tomorrow. Um, and we have a few uh, interview subjects that we're still waiting to lock in. But this is a project that we want to really move quickly on. Um, you know, because the science is always evolving, you know, this topic in three years is going to be, you know, a whole new discussion. Um, in 10 years, it's going to be a completely different disease altogether. Uh, just, you know, going off of the exponential way that things accelerate today. Um, but we want to get this film submitted to film festivals by the end of the year. So, um, so that's really my goal. It's to, it's to move quickly. It's to, you know, we've already had incredible support from, you know, David Perlmutter, from um, all of the, all of the, you know, desired interviewees. We're going to go out to L.A. and talk to Del Bredesen, who's doing incredible work. Uh, Suzanne Delamonte at Brown, we've already interviewed. Um, Suzanne Kraft, I'm speaking to. She's, you know, no commitment yet, but she would be amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that's the process, really. It's it's just lining things up. It can be slow, but we're going to try to just, you know, move as fast as we can. I want to get to work now with, you know, our backers have been so incredibly generous uh, that it really puts me and the project in a great position where we can really pick and choose who we want to work with. And so I want to be very – I want to move fast, but I also want to do, it, do so cautiously. Um, in knowing that I can really work with whoever I want. And so I want to work with the best. I want to really um, deliver the best film that I can. And I, you know, I tend to have very high standards for myself. And so I, I'm anticipating uh, that it's going to be a good watch, or at least I hope so. <laughs> well, Max, I'm looking okay. forward to seeing Breadhead at Sundance next January. Yes, that's exactly. <laughs> We'll, Your we'll lips just, to God's ears, We'll just Alex. affirm that right now. Yes, exactly. So your Kickstarter campaign ended, and it was very successful, but uh, I, I know there's people that still want to help with the Breadhead Project. What what can they do to help you move this forward? Great question. Well, the best way to help is to go to breadheadmovie.com. It's a really terrible-looking website. Uh, we, you know, we're trying to pull all these things together at once and it's a lot of work, but um, on, on that splash page, you can sign up for our mailing list. So please sign up for our mailing list uh, so that we can continue to get the word out um, about, you know, what we're up to. I also like to sort of do vlogs now sort of initiated by the success of the campaign. I'm trying to do like weekly YouTube vlogs about, you know, how the process is going. Um, And then there's also a link for you to contribute still Um, the, you know, the, the, the whole Kickstarter thing that has wrapped, but if you want to make a contribution, a donation to the project, you can do that via our PayPal link. And then lastly, follow me on, on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, this is my focus. So, uh, you know, the more followers that we, I mean, it sounds so, you know, like everybody, you know, in news media is like, you know, follow me on Twitter. But really what it does is it proves that there's an audience for this. Um, so so that is significant. That is a significant way to help, believe it or not. Um, and so that's it. Great. Max, how's your mom? She's, you know, she's good. She's got me. So, you know, I'm helping. Um, and things are, like, stable, you know. It's, again, she's got, like, a weird thing going on but yeah things are I think things are good you know there's people that that are way less fortunate uh, than we so um, knock on wood things right now are okay okay good well Max thank you and uh, that concludes tonight's program to learn more about Max and Breadhead visit breadheadmovie.com or maxlugavir Dot com. Uh, for more information on the listening program and our work at Advanced Brain Technologies, visit advancedbrain.com. Uh, 
Max, thanks again for uh, joining me tonight, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Brain Podcast with best-selling author, keynote speaker, and founder of Advanced Brain Technologies, Alex Doman. In the show notes, you can find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it's free to subscribe, and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, you'll find it right there waiting for you to listen to in your podcast app of choice. And for more information regarding the world's most innovative neuroscience-based music programs for optimal human performance, please visit advancedbrain.com.